a tremendous pleasure to be here today. And I have to say, I didn't expect all of this. <laughs> this is a huge room, and I'm so happy so many of you uh, came out. It's, it's a big affirmation. My best friend in life, where's Dwayne? There he is, Dwayne Fulton came, came out to see me. So, you know, Chicago's my hometown. So, uh, <laughs> got a lot of feelings and it's really a great pleasure to, to be here tonight and your wonderful introduction, just the spirit of the place. Uh, I hope I can live up to all that. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> uh, my, my mission is to just give you guys an overview of our research on stereotype threat and social identity threat uh, and then to talk about it. We'll have time at the end to, to talk about it. I want to preserve some time. Uh, my aim is to convince you that stereotype threat and social identity threat, these are social psychological phenomenon, but I, I want to convince you that they're important, that they're a big deal in all of our lives, that everybody experiences some form or another of these things and that they uh, play a big role in our lives. They affect who we, who we take on as friends, uh, what regions of the country we feel comfortable living in, what neighborhoods we feel comfortable living in, how we perform in certain areas of performance, academics, athletics, uh, all kinds of things, these phenomena have a big driving effect. And I want to make that clear, but I don't want to be depressing. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to talk about uh, remedies when, when these kinds of uh, pressures uh, become negative and start to systematically interfere with the performance especially of uh, entire groups of people. Uh, what do you do about that? So I want to spend a considerable amount of time, save some time to uh, talk about remedies and how to think about remedies. You guys are probably going to uh, come up with things as, as well as, uh, as I, I can, knowing your own situation. And some things you probably uh, have already come up with that are probably uh, uh, very effective. So uh, I want to reserve as much time as I can for that. Uh, I often, uh, there are two sort of sub-themes I like to uh, stress that I hope you also pick up from, from the talk. Uh, the f sure. I just want to address your mic. Ah. Your little, um, your little funny. Sentence. A technological <laughs> intervention. <laughs> One, two, three. That, is that? Is that good? All right. Okay. Well, um, the. I don't have to talk so loud now, do I? <laughs> uh, one, one, one theme is just uh, the nature of uh, science. Uh, a lot of the ideas, all the ideas that you're going to hear about were not ideas that we had when we began this research. And uh, so for students in, in, in the uh, audience and people who are interested in, in the science of things, uh, I, I offer this research as an example of something where you, you embark on a line of research, you start doing experiments, and you find out things you never thought were going to be there. Something like stereotype threat was certainly not an idea we had before we embarked on this research. And it's, it unfolds like kind of a mystery. There's a lot of fun in, in doing uh, research of this sort. So I hope that's a sub-theme that you uh, pick up. I wrote the book in that way, like a mystery story, because that's kind of the way you experience the uh, science, is one question leading to the next and on. So uh, that's a theme I, I hope you, you note. Uh, another theme is just, and this is something that, that just uh, hit us over the head a million times. We're psychologists, so uh, we tend to, to think of the human psych psyche, the brain, as in an almost decontextualized way. And I think a lot of us think that way. I think that's the nature of lay psychology, is to, 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 to think of individuals and not see the context and the way in which the context shapes our behaviors and our, our apparent talents and all kinds of things come from the, the experience, the, the context we're in. So I hope you pick up that too. Stereotype threat is in essence a contextual variable. It's a contextual factor. It's something you have to deal with in your context. It's not necessarily a trait or a characteristic that's inside you. It's something that goes with your identity in particular situations. And so uh, uh, the, the good news in that is that some of the bad effects it has can be uh, uh, eliminated or reduced by changing that context, by changing the degree to which that context suggests and imposes stereotype threat on the individual. So that's another theme uh, 
I'd like you to get out of this. Uh, the, the talk will have three parts. I'll talk about the problem that we that, that started all of this research. We had, you know, as I as I just said, there was no idea of what caused this problem. The, the research started with just the identification of a problem, seeing something. I think that's one of the best gifts that a, a scientist can have is to stumble on a really good problem. You know it's a problem, you know it's important, and really nobody quite knows how to think about it. And that's the good fortune that happened to us uh, in this case. So I'll start out with that problem. Then I'll talk about stereotype threat, remind you a little bit of that, illustrate it, give you some sense of the research behind it, and then we'll get into remedies. So those are the three uh, sections I'll try to, to cover. Uh, the, the problem, uh, as I uh, do talk about in the, in the book, um, it came to me all at once vividly uh, as we moved from the University of Washington to the University of Michigan. And within a matter of weeks, I was on a committee, a faculty committee on the recruitment and retention of minority students at the University of Michigan. And on the top of the top page of a whole stack of papers that we were all given as the new school year began was a graph. And the graph had on it the grade point averages of the University of Michigan students, the cumulative grade points they got while they were at Michigan as a function of the SAT scores they had when they came in. And what you see is what I saw there, uh, that kids who came in with higher SAT scores tended on average to have somewhat higher cumulative grade point averages at Michigan than kids who had lower SAT scores when they entered. No surprise to that. If there's any, any surprise to it, it would be how weak that relationship was. Uh, and we can talk about that uh, later. That, or that, or, but don't get me started, that is a whole separate lecture. <coughs> how little those tests capture. But anyway, I'll come back to that, <laughs> I, I promise. Uh, but there was a relationship. Um, the other thing that was, the, the thing that was dramatic and confusing and it kind of went against my uh, presumptions was a second line that was broken out for African American students at Michigan. And uh, it graphed their grade point averages out as a function of the SAT scores they had when, when uh, they entered Michigan. And it had roughly the same slope to it. The, better, the, the kids with the better scores tended to have the better grades, again, quite weakly. But what was really interesting is that at every level of entering SAT score at every single level from about in those days about a 1050 or so all the way up to almost like a perfect score of 1600. At every level African American students were getting lower grades than other students with the same SAT scores. That's what was confusing is I kind of presumed that if you got preparation for college uh, roughly equal uh, that you'd see the same kind of performance going on. Uh, that, that if you've got kids all, uh, all the way up to a 1500 SAT score, very high SAT score, that all kids with that, same, with that score would, would, would get very good grades because those are very hard scores to get and they, that indicates a very high level of preparation, at least roughly so. So I would have expected that they'd get the same grades, but they didn't. African American students got lower grades at 1500 and at 1200 and at 1000 and all the way up at 1600. So that's what was confusing. That was the problem. That was a mystery. What, would it, what was still driving these scores lower? If I found that the black grades were lower than the white grades on average, that would not be surprising. Because among the kids that would be good enough academically to get into the University of Michigan, given the, the way in which race still affects educational opportunity in this society, you could still expect that on average the African American students might have somewhat lower grades than, uh, than white students at that, uh, on that campus. <clears throat> but what was surprising is that even when you equated for these S on SAT scores, this, this, this almost sacred measure of preparation for college work, uh, th there, was th there was this difference. Uh, within about three weeks, we found that exactly the same thing was true for women and men, com women compared to men in advanced math courses. That uh, the women who had the same SAT scores as the men for advanced math courses at Michigan were getting lower grades. So wow, why, why would that be the case? Uh, so we, I, we, we, we had this puzzle 
uh, this is the way uh, science work. It, it works. It probably took us about probably about six years from that first encounter with that problem to a, a concept like stereotype threat. It took up that, that long wandering through the wilderness trying to figure out, well, what could this possibly be, and trying that experiment, and trying this experiment, and on and on. Uh, but we did know we had a, uh, an important problem because in addition to what we found at the University of Michigan, we went to the literature on, on uh, testing and psychometric literature, and we found that, the same, that this had been long known, this problem, it's, it's called underperformance, where a group, especially when they're doing very difficult work, does not perform as well as another group if their abilities are negatively stereotyped in the larger society. If their abilities, be they academic abilities or a even a athletic abilities, if those abilities are negatively stereotyped in a broader society, that group does not g generally perform as well as other groups, especially when the work is difficult and challenging sort of at the frontier of their skills. We found this was lawful in American society, that you could walk into any integrated classroom uh, uh, and you could find this phenomenon of underperformance. Uh, and uh, you could find it uh, for women in math in, in uh, uh, areas where the math was difficult and challenging. So uh, this was, as I say, the puzzle that launched this research. I will spare you the years of sort of wandering through the wilderness trying to think of things. Some of the things we came up with just completely ridiculous in retrospect. Uh, but eventually we came to this notion of, of stereotype threat that there's something about being under the possible gaze of a negative stereotype about your group that when you're really trying hard and working on frustrating work can be interfering. That's the, the heart of the matter. The definition of stereotype threat is very simple. It, and it, you'll see right away, it's something that happens to everybody, I think maybe even a couple times a day. Uh, it is whenever you're doing something or you're in a situation for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities applies, is relevant to you. When that is the case, you know that you could be judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if you care about what you're doing, the prospect of being reduced to a negative stereotype in this area is upsetting and distracting, and it can undermine your performance right then and there in the situation. And it can make you feel so uncomfortable in this domain that you just don't really want to choose that domain as a walk of life. It can affect major choices in life. You experience it kind of as a discomfort and anxiety and never coming to peace with the, with the situation, a kind of constant vigilance about what's happening. Am I being seen this way? Am I not being seen this way? That's the nature of stereotype threat. Just being in a situation, you're doing something, and this uh, stereotype about one of your identities, it could be your race, it could be your gender, it could be your socioeconomic status, it could be your age, a form of stereotype threat, which I increasingly pay attention to. Uh, when you're in a situation where stereotypes about that identity are relevant, something comes up in the conversation, or you're doing something for which that, a stereotype about that identity is relevant, you you know you could be seen uh, in, in terms of the stereotype. Now if the stereotype is kind of not a particularly important one, uh, like some of the age stereotypes are not particularly important, some are kind of important. Uh, someone just before the talk was asking me about the, the stereotype threat effect, effects that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, people with uh, uh, mental illness experience, just, just saying that. that. Well, that can be a very powerful form of stereotype threat. The prospect of being seen that way can be very <laughs> upsetting to uh, a person. So the, the strength of the effect varies a lot with the stereotype and so on. But it is, that, that, that is what it is. It's, it's not uh, 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 a mysterious thing. It is a, a, a simple, straightforward situation where you recognize in this particular society, people like me could be seen in this way. Uh, I've been trying to find examples of it that sort of go against our expectations. Uh, and I can remember in my lab group a couple years ago talking to my graduate students about this and they were encouraging me to get some more updated examples of, uh, of uh, stereotype threat. So we tried to think of, well, where would, it, where would, the, where would a, a white male be under stereotype threat around intellectual things? Where would that happen in society? 
Uh, my, my son is a, is a jazz musician and he went to a music conservatory and when it got to the point where people were learning how to improvise, that was an area where for some reason in American society, given the, the sources of, of American jazz, black guys were seen to be better than white guys. So the example we were led to was, well, where would this be? Well, maybe it would be, maybe it would be in rapping. Maybe that would be an area, rapping, where uh, black guys might be seen to, be, you know, to have uh, a disadvantage compared to black guys. That's a stereotype, again. It's a stereotype we're talking about. Uh, so uh, the example I'm going to show you is the first few minutes of, uh, of Eminem's uh, Eight Mile, which is the autobi his autobiography. Uh, and what you see, first you see how difficult the, how, what an intellectual challenge rapping is, because uh, just, just so you kind of know the context, um, what, what ha two rappers come on stage, it's a coin flip, and one rapper goes first, and his job is to think up on the spot a bunch of insults that he levels at this, the second rapper who, who goes second. And he has to think these insults up as fast as he can. They have to be kind of poetic, and they're evaluated for that. And they have to be in time, and they have to be in rhyme. That's hard to do with a crowd pulsing there in front of you. Uh, and the poor second rapper who loses the coin flip, he has to defend himself poetically and eloquently. So he has to do this again, make it all up on the spot, and he has to do it in time and in rhyme. So it is a highly pressured, challenging intellectual uh, performance, to, to uh, say the least. Uh, and there is in this domain a, 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 a racial stereotype called white with a mic. And it's, if, you, if you are performing and you're, you're white with a mic means you're, you're lame, you're not doing a good, you know, we don't expect. <laughs> I'll, I'll let the clip speak for itself. That may be a better, a better job here. It's a rough day there for Eminem. Uh, you know, the good news, if you've seen the movie, in, in a sense, the whole movie is, is about his journey out of this intense stereotype threat and difficulty performing. And, you know, he goes on to become one of the greatest rappers of all time. And that's, the, that's part of the story. But up front, there is this whole challenge to his belongingness based on stereotypes tied to, to his particular identity. And you see in this opening episode, the impact of it on the immediate situation of a, of a performance. Most people at that point might, might have been enough and they would never try that again. Uh, but he persists and, and uh, to, to a great uh, renown as, as time goes on. Uh, one of the things I want you to pay attention to from this videotape are the cues, the events that happen as he comes on stage. Because when we get to the point about remedies and we get to the point of understanding what makes stereotype threat strongly felt uh, one of the things that, our, again, our research pushed us into is the realization that a lot of it has to do with these cues, the circumstances the, that signal to you whether or not, based on this identity, based that you belong in this situation. This is an extremely intense uh, version of it. Uh, but you can see all of those cues. Who's banging on the door? Is he seen as legitimate? He's not really seen as legitimate backstage. Uh, he gets on stage, immediately the stereotype is hurled at him, then there's a crowd hurling. You can begin to get the, the image in a very uh, strong way. Well, then, of course, the next question is, is, does this form of stereotype threat go to school? Could it be powerful enough to affect academic performance in school? Uh, that, that's, uh, uh, whether it exists as a phenomenon is one thing, but as a phenomenon, is it strong enough to have an impact on academic performance? We tend to think of pressures like this as things that can be overcome if people just persist hard enough and long enough and try, and that they don't amount to a real serious burden or barrier to good academic performance. That's probably the way, a part of our assumptive world about things, and in fact, our use of standardized testing in such a, in such a powerful way in our systems uh, is almost a testament to that assumption. That's what we kind of assume about them. For them to be valid, we, we, we have to assume that identity differences don't make that much difference on something like a standardized test, that our abilities are able to sort of push through those pressures and you can get a pretty good read on a person's uh, abilities and so on that way. 
Well, here's another videotape. This is uh, a, something you may have, uh, have seen. It's a, it's a, a snippet from uh, the blue-eyed, brown-eyed experiment that happened many, many years ago. In fact, the first version of it was uh, the day after Martin Luther King is assassinated in Riceville, Iowa. A teacher named Jane Elliott decides that she wants to think up uh, an experience so that her kids living in this very homogeneous community would have some sense about what Martin Luther King's life was about, what the civil rights movement was about, and so on. So she decides that based on the eye color of her students, she's going to stigmatize them as a way of giving them some experience of what Dr. King's life was about. So she stays up most of the night and sews collars, either brown collars or blue collars, uh, irons them, and then the next day she goes into school and she decides the first to be stigmatized will be the brown-eyed students. So she comes in, she has the brown-eyed students all put on brown collars around their, their necks. And she stands in the front of the classroom. You could never do this kind of thing uh, these days. So, so <laughs> this, this would be just unacceptable. You can go on YouTube and you can follow what happened to all these kids. You can follow the different versions of this experiment. There's a rich literature around what she did that day. But what she did was to stand in front of the classroom and tell, say to the, to the students that, look, brown-eyed people are bad people. They're not smart people. They don't smell good. They should get up and go in the back of the classroom. And she makes them get up and go in the back of the classroom. And the ABC news camera catches the, the, the terror on the face of these children having their teacher say this to them. Uh, and, how they, and follows them throughout the day and how they, they're stunned and they huddle together in the playground. They don't play. It's just, it's a disaster. Uh, the, the only fairness in the situation is that the very next day she does the same thing for the blue-eyed students. She puts a blue collar on them, and she says at the beginning of the day, blue-eyed students are not good, blue-eyed people are not good people. They're not smart people. They smell bad, and they should go to the back of the classroom. I made a mistake yesterday. It's blue-eyed students, and she goes on. Well, uh, the interesting th thing, there is, as I say, a whole literature around this demonstration that Jane Elliott uh, thought up, and Jane Elliott's a rather famous person to this day. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a little a sidebar in the in initial documentary that uh, shows these students uh, working through at a little table, working with her on a set of, a, a problem set, and they're keeping track of how fast they can work, they can solve this problem set. How many minutes does it take? Does it take three minutes? Does it take five minutes? So they're racing through these things as fast as they can. And you start to see the pattern that uh, I'm, I'm talking about in this, in the performance of these kids. So I'll, I'll show you that. Well, so maybe, you know, the social experience of being stigmatized on an everyday basis could have some effect on how people perform in school or how they, and how they perform in other places. Um, you might think that stereotypes really are, are gone, but it um, <laughs> doesn't begin to be true. Uh, I, I just heard a talk the other day by a, a colleague in our psych department who uh, did a study in Oakland where they're in, in, a, in a junior high school where they're, they're, there's roughly equal number of white kids, Latino kids, Asian kids, and black kids. And these are seventh graders, and she's just observing their use of stereotypes. And you know, they, it's, it's almost like at that age, they're, they're discovering stereotypes, group stereotypes, and they kind of enjoy it a little bit. It's like a new, a new handle on life. And so they, they, they play with it and, and use these stereotypes. And, and one, one area where she can really see it is how do they, hand, what, how do they behave when somebody performs something that's not that's counter-stereotypic. So she got this, this beautiful example of this black boy who gets the highest grade on a math test and one of the math tests in, in, in the seventh grade. And all the other kids are really very happy for him. And they say, man, that's fantastic. You must have some Asian in you. <laughs> so um, stereotypes, we'll talk about where they come from and, you know, and the like. But, uh, the, 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 the way in which Jane Elliott did this is very heavy-handed, and the, the M&M example is very heavy-handed. 
Uh, so our, our research had to ask the question, is, is just simply being in a, in a situation where a stereotype about your group, a negative stereotype, is relevant, a situation you care about is relevant, would that be enough to affect your performance? So the very first experiment we did, which turns out to be kind of a prototype for many, many, uh, probably almost a, thousand, a couple thousand or so that have, have followed, was a very simple study we did at the University of Michigan years ago. We got really talented, good, uh, men and women, sophomore math students. These were students that were really good at math and identified with it in the sense of it's being very important to them. Uh, and we took them, uh, got them, brought them into the lab one at a time and we gave them a very difficult math test, a half hour section of the graduate record exam you would take if you were a math major, not the general quantitative section, but the maths test in the GRE, a half hour section of this for these, these math students. Now they're really good. I could never answer any of these questions, but for them, these were within the pale, hard, frustrating, but within the pale for them. Well, our idea was this, that that frustration with that test, just the experience of that frustration would make it a different experience taking that test for the men than for the women. For the men, they would worry, Jesus, uh, this is a hard test. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was at math. And they could be uh, a little upset about that. But for the women, in addition to thinking that, they would also have to realize at some level, probably maybe slightly pre-conscious, but at some level or another, that their group, they would, the stereotype about their group's math ability would become relevant as an interpretation of what was happening to them personally in that situation. Maybe, maybe I have, you know, kind of reached this, my Waterloo with regard to, to math, the, the, the limits that uh, people sort of think women might reach in this kind of situation. And that extra worry and the effort to refute it and to argue with it inside your head is now interfering with your performance on the math test. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The women who we knew, just like in the underperformance phenomenon, we knew were just as good as the men we'd carefully picked them for that. They performed a full standard deviation worse than the men in that situation. Full standard deviation worse. Now, somebody, as people, I can't tell you how naive we were at this point because we didn't realize that that very data could be used to support the stereotype about women's math ability that look Claude all you found as many people said is that when you give difficult math tests that's where the biological difference between men and women manifests itself and that's why women didn't score as well on that test as men did and so that's all you've done is validate the damn stereotype so, uh, you know, we didn't quite realize this, thinking all this up. We were coming from underperformance, trying to figure out how to get it in the lab. And so, so we, this was nerve wracking, this period of time in the, in the laboratory. The last thing we wanted to do was confirm that. So it, it took about a year. We knew what we had to do. We had to do the experiment over again, but this time we had to do it in a way that stereotype threat would not be there for the women. We had to do something that would take that particular pressure and that pressure alone out of this testing situation and see how they performed. Again, sparing you a lot of lost time in the wilderness, uh, we came up with a very simple sentence. And the sentence was this. Look, we, told the, we did the experiment over again. We told the men and women, again, who went through this one at a time, a room all by themselves, just before they went in the room, we said, look, you may have heard that women are not as good as men at difficult standardized math tests, but that's not true for this math test, not the test you're taking today. On the test you're taking today, women always do as well as men. <laughs> you know? Subtext is, there's nothing you could experience on this test that would say anything about your being a woman. You could find that you're not as good at math as you thought you were, but you couldn't find that you weren't as good at math because you were a woman, because this test never shows anything about women. It's always all this particular. So, I wouldn't be here today if the following results did not happen. <laughs> Which are that, with that one sentence, the women perform just as well as the men. Just as well as the men. I can't tell you, that's probably, uh, you know, outside of my personal life, that's certainly probably one of the biggest days in my, 
in my academic life is that, wow, that, this thing could be that powerful, this pressure could be that powerful, that if you take it out like that, performance goes up. Uh, then Josh Aronson and I did it, uh, did it with race. Uh, I'll tell you a race study that's better than the one we did. It's got some niceties to it. Um, just giving black and white college students an IQ test, the Raven's Progressive Matrices, which is a nonverbal IQ test. Every single item is a big square with a pattern on it, and then there are five little squares with patterns on them, and you have to pick which pattern on the little square matches the pattern on the big square. And as it, as it goes along, it gets really hard to do that. Progressive matrices. It's easy, then really hard, and frustrating. And remember, frustration is the issue here. Frustration, that's what makes the stereotype about your group relevant to you personally, to the interpretation of what's happening to you personally. So, when we did that, the black students got, uh, just gave them a te this, uh, this test and we let them either assume it was an IQ test or we told them it was a test of cognitive abilities. Black students performed a standard deviation worse than white students, which is exactly the difference between whites and blacks in IQ performance in the general population. 15 points on an IQ test. That's what that looks like. Another condition though, this is why I like to tell this experiment, that because of the nature of the test, you didn't have to represent it as a test, you could simply represent it as a puzzle. As a puzzle. It had nothing, has nothing to do with how smart you are. It's just, it's just a puzzle. Well, when you're doing a puzzle, frustration is fun. That's what you're doing the puzzle for, is to experience that frustration and apply yourself and beat that thing. It, it, it induces, you know, that kind of an attitude. And with that simple change in, in instruction, black students scored exactly the same as white students on that IQ test. So, you know, we're starting to get confident here that there is a phenomenon in play that has a, a significant impact on, on academic uh, performance. We went to Poland. Poland is a society where there are very few gender differences in the quantitative fields. About half of the physicists, engineers, uh, physicians are women. It's probably, no, I don't really understand it, but it's probably an outgrowth of communism and a kind of strict mandated egalitarianism of that era. But at any rate, that's the way it is in Poland. So in Poland, uh, the reason we went there is that there isn't a real evidential basis for this stereotype about women in, in math. You can look around you, but it doesn't make sense. So the stereotype there is very weak. There are other stereotypes there. But not that particular one in the same degree, the same strength that is in the United States. And in Poland, you know, we didn't get much stereotype threat effect in, in women in, in math. Just very tiny little, uh, little effects. So we're beginning to sort of corner in on the idea that it is the stereotype structure that, may, that, that characterizes a given society that has a huge role in driving, driving these patterns of, of performance. That's the basic. Uh, uh, I, that's the basic idea. There are all kinds of things that we know about it now. It's mediated in very simple ways. When you're under stereotype threat and you're trying to perform a, a, a test or you're sitting in a classroom, uh, you, you're doing two things. You're multitasking. One thing is you're doing the task that's in front of you that everybody else is doing, but the other thing is you're monitoring how you're going to be seen and whether or not the first mistake you make is going to be the mistake that leads everybody to see you in terms of that damn stereotype. And you're vigilant to it. You're like uh, Eminem coming on stage. You're looking at, what, why do they, why they treat me like this? What's the... Just because... Huh? And that is, of course, absorbing and using cognitive resources. There are all kinds of brain uh, uh, MRI studies that show the allocation of, 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 of cognitive resources being affected by uh, stereotype threat, that show the physiological reactions that, that, that go with that. Uh, uh, so you, you, you get a very clear, simple picture. It's, it's, it's just plain old uh, multitasking. It's trying to, trying to alternate between two things. One is doing the task and the other is rejecting the stereotype and disproving it and being dedicated to disproving it and so on. People used to say, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's a giving in to the stereotype. The person has internalized the stereotype and they are just in this situation, it's triggered and they're fulfilling it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Not true. It's the opposite. 
The only people that we got these effects on were the effects were, were the people that were so good in the domain. They're like Eminem as to rapping. They were like the vanguard of their group with regard to performance uh, in the domain. It was really good women math students. It was really good African American uh, college students. If you didn't care about one way you could protect yourself against stereotype threat is just not to give a damn about the domain where the stereotype applies. So you can see that that's a, a, an adaptation that the stereotype might drive. After, after a while of dealing with this stereotype, uh, uh, and the pressure it puts on you in a domain, a person might say, there must be a happier way for me to live my life. I've got to find some place where I'm going to feel more comfortable, and they could just choose another domain of life. So that's how the, that's how the pressure works. I mean, I, you know, if you get me started, I can go into all kinds of examples like this. I'm doing now just sort of on an amateur newspaper reading kind of basis because I don't really have time to do the kind of research I was just describing anymore. Uh, uh, where, where are the white guys in the NBA come from? Because uh, that's an area where, you know, if you're a white guy, uh, making it all the way into the, into the uh, NBA is a pretty big deal. You have to go through a life-long ga gauntlet of being seen in terms of negative stereotypes about your ability. You have to persist that long. Uh, you're going to deal with stereotype threat along the way. So my prediction, of course, is that uh, the white guys in the NBA are going to come disproportionately from different societies where the stereotypes weren't so heavily in play. The racial stereotypes that we have around athletics aren't so, aren't, aren't so prominent. So I can get quite carried away with interpreting all kinds of group differences and patterns of performance in terms of these things. I invite you to do the same. Uh, of course, we all have to test these things eventually to see how strong they are, whether they hold up or, or not. But it's, it's interesting. Uh, one, one thing I think it's important to point out, and then I'll get into remedies here, when you ask yourself what uh, makes them strong, uh, as I was just saying, initially, uh, we thought that these things were uh, caused by, uh, you know, maybe low self-esteem, insecurity, less skills, all that sort of thing. No, the effects were the biggest for the members of the group who had the most confidence and the most skills. What makes you affected by stereotype threat is not anything about your self-esteem or your sense of confidence. It makes, what makes you subject to it is that you, have, you care about performing well in the domain where your group is negatively stereotyped. You've made the M&M mistake. You have identified and invested in a domain of life and put a lot of yourself into it where your group is negatively seen. So now you can't just walk away from that situation. You have to deal with it. And it's the pressure of dealing with it that makes that threat strongly felt. And I should point out, it's not something that, this will be my last clip, it's not something that is just a, a passing thing. You can just disprove it once and it's, it's over. The, the threat can happen to you in any situation or any time you're in a situation where that stereotype is applicable. Wherever it's applicable, you've got to deal with it. So I'll give you uh, uh, the last videotape is an interview by, uh, that Bill Maher does of Charles Blow. Charles Blow, as you probably know, is African-American New York Times uh, editorialist and of, of great relevance to the present moment. He's talking about the experience of Trayvon Martin and how it makes him feel as this very sophisticated uh, uh, editorialist for the New York Times, but you get the sense here of how stereotype threat can become a condition of life. It's something that goes with the identity in situations. Well, I, you know, I think that's a very good way to understand the experience of uh, African Americans, certainly in these recent weeks, is just the sense that whew, in all these situations, um, I could be misconstrued. Uh, and, um, and shot. Uh, so, I, I, you, know, it, it, and, uh, you know, one way of describing, I, I thought about trying to characterize, well, what's the experience, why is it so upsetting? Well, th I think that's enough to, to be upsetting to a person is to feel that kind of vulnerability uh, walking around the streets. But uh, I, th I think it's also the case that the identity becomes very weighty when you have to deal with a lot of very, or a good number of very important negative stereotypes about your group across a very important 
set of circumstances in, in life, in school, uh, on the street, uh, in certain kinds of interactions, when it's like always there. That's one way of understanding what the nature of the, of the burden is. White stereotype threat is a powerful, virulent form of stereotype threat. We did a, an experiment of bringing white guys into the laboratory, again, one at a time, and they thought they were going to be in a conversation with two other students, and, and by looking at photographs, they, are, they learn that the two people they're going to talk to in this conversation are either two white guys or two black guys. And they learn that they're going to be talking either about something that's kind of racially neutral, love and relationships on campus, or they're going to talk about something that's kind of loaded, racial profiling. So they know they're going to talk about um, to two white guys or two black guys, either about racial profiling or about love and relationships on campus. And then the experimenter says, look, I'm going to go down the hall and get your two conversation partners. Would you mind arranging the three chairs here for that conversation? Would you, would you do that? Uh, sure. Uh, and you can tell that that's kind of what we're after. As soon as they arrange those three chairs, basically the experiment's over. Uh, and you can probably predict what's going to happen. When they're going to talk to two white guys about anything, they put the three chairs very close together. And when they're going to talk to two black guys about love and relationships, they put the three chairs very close together. But when they're going to talk to two black guys, two strangers, about racial profiling, they put the two black guys down here and they put themselves over here. A, a great distance comes uh, between them. It's loaded. It's difficult in America. This, you know, because the stereotypes about whites, what's, it, what's this form of the stereotype threat there? The stereotype that's, that's relevant in this situation? The stereotype that's relevant is that whites are racist. And if I'm going to talk about racial profiling, I could make a mistake, I could make a boo-boo, and, and uh, I would be seen that way. And interestingly, because since we measured how prejudiced they were before the experiment began in several modern ways of doing that, we had some indication of how much, how prejudiced they, they were in this situation. These are college students, they're not really that prejudiced, but there's a difference between them. And interestingly, it was the least prejudiced people who put the greatest distance between themselves and the two black guys for that conversation. It's the best women math students who show the effects of stereotype threat on performance. It's the best African American students who show the effects of stereotype threat on, on performance and, and identification with college. It's investing in the domain. So if, this if, if you're invested in seeing yourself as a not prejudiced person, this is a very self so, you know, important uh, concept to oneself, then the prospect of being in this conversation with two black guys talking about racial profiling who you don't know is upsetting. It, 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 geez, I could find out something. So there becomes a kind of avoidance. And, and that, that, that may be one of the biggest parts of our racial challenge in the United States is, this, is, is avoidance like that. Just because the stakes are so high for uh, making a mistake, it makes people uncomfortable in the topic gets, gets uh, a push, push to the side. So, uh, but that, that gives you one window into that. But the, if you want to kind of think about the difference between, you know, w w one way of thinking about black stereotype threat and white stereotype threat, the, this is our history visiting us in the, in, mo in the present moment. This is American history. These stereotypes come out of American history and they affect our lives in the immediate moment and this is, how, this is what it looks like is this kind of distancing behavior, these kind of underperformances. These things reflect our history. If you go to a, a different society with a different set of stereotypes, you won't get this pattern of stereotype threat effects. You'll get another pattern, but you won't get this particular pattern. This is our stereotype footprint, and this is kind of uh, uh, what it looks like in, in, this, in, in this situation. So I think in, in just in terms of understanding the terrain of where we're at, the concept has some utility. Well, how do you remedy this? Uh, I think the important thing is to first recognize that it isn't something so much uh, inside the person as it is in the context of, of their lives. It's the prospect of being seen or treated in terms of that stereotype that upsets a person who's very identified with doing well in that domain. That's, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, when you see Eminem come out of the bathroom, 
uh, the things that make that threat so powerful are all the ways that he's treated, which signal to him that he could be seen in terms of that stereotype. You're reading, the, he's reading cues, a part of his brain is reading cues, of course, about uh, uh, why he's seen, how he's seen that way. He's, he's adding it up, you know. Uh, we count uh, when we go into situations and we're one of a small minority of a given identity. Uh, we tend to count how many other people there are like us in the situation. I go hear my son uh, uh, band play, play music and I just find myself, you know, looking around saying, well, just how many other gray-headed people are there in here with me now? You know, and why, why am I doing that? I, I don't even, I, I'm not even consciously, I just, you're just kind of counting up, well, who's, in, who's here like me in this, in this situation? So some part of us is assessing, is there some risk here? Does this identity I have put me at some risk in, in, in this situation? So a, a lot of it originates that way. There's a great story I, I, I won't take time to tell now, but of Sandra Day O'Connor being asked about being the only uh, woman on the Supreme Court, and, and her answer was, oh, geez, it was terrible. It was asphyxiating, she said being the only woman on the Supreme Court. It was terrible. Uh, people followed me everywhere. They, they questioned my intelligence, my, my maturity, my integrity, everything, all the time. Uh, the person, the interviewer says, well, what happened when Ruth Bader Ginsburg got there? She said, well, it, it, it kind of went away then. It kind of went away. There were two women on the, port, on the court at that point, and it didn't quite make sense for reporters and other people to make the same judgment. These were two very different women, and so it kind of so confused the point that it, she felt free as soon as another woman came on the su Supreme Court. Well, that's a perfect example of how the situation can make you feel a given identity in one situation. is an incredible experience of stereotype threat. Changes ever so slightly. She gets a little critical mass, as it's called in the legal literature. Another a critical mass of people with her identity. And all of a sudden, she doesn't feel the same kind of stereotype threat in the, in the situation. You can begin to see how remedy can take form, how, how it can begin to take form. You can affect uh, the, the cues in a situation. I, I, I'm not going to detail a lot of experiments that kind of very little cues and so show that the size of the stereotype threat effect on, on performance can be made uh, to vary. Just take my word for it. Read chapter 8. It goes into great detail <laughs> in those uh, experiments. But let me give you three general categories of remedy. The, the first thing I think that you have to realize about these phenomena is that they reflect the way in which our society is organized around these identities. I can remember doing an intervention years ago at the university, a, a, a program at the, at the University of Michigan to reduce uh, stereotype threat. And I kind of, I didn't actually move in, but I was in this dormitory for about six months, all every day, looking at, you know, just being a part of this thing. And I remember at the beginning of the year, all of the adults, the, the counselors and people like me came in and we made great speeches about how, uh, e how important equality was, how important diversity was. We said all of the right things. And students kind of like these refreshments, they kind of, yeah, that's kind of interesting and so on. But uh, about uh, three or four weeks went by and all of a sudden the fraternities and sororities started their rushing. And then all of a sudden the black students are left in the cafeteria while the white students go out and rush their fraternities and sororities. And then a couple weeks later, the black sororities and fraternities, they, they do their rushing and so the whites are alone in the cafeteria and the blacks are off rushing their their fraternities and sororities. So you can see right away that there's this rhetoric here, this good intention, but down on the ground, there is an American organization of their social lives and their lives by race. And they see it. And they know that some of the most important things in their lives are gonna be affected by that organization. And so no matter what the adults say, that cue is again like M&M &M coming out of the, the bathroom. It's a signal that that identity, no matter what they say, is still damned important in life. It's still important. That again is how history shapes our everyday experience. We'd like to get past that, but there's the way the society is organized in these little ways that make that a big, a big deal. Uh, and that is where the, the whole sense of threat uh, comes from. 
And then, and then once that thread right? is there, the student sees that, well, how many other people think this about my race? It opens up the whole question that I have to keep on the burner while I'm a student there, trying to enter into the situation. And I'm assessing everything. And sure enough, I'm going to find some things which are going to, which are going to strengthen that interpretation of my experience there, that race is an extremely uh, important thing in that, in, in that situation. And it, it, it builds in, in this way to be quite a framework for viewing one's experience and for like uh, creating a whole experience of going to college, much like the experience of being in one of our stereotype threat studies. Frustration, interpretation, it, it all comes, to, co comes together that way. So uh, I think that's the first thing to keep in mind is that it grows out of the way in which our schools and other institutions are organized. And the first thing to think about, of course, is are there ways we can organize these places so things like that don't happen so much? Or if they do happen, if they're beyond our control, are there ways that we can organize and prepare students that they don't have that interpretation of, of what's going on. One of the things we did at Michigan was to, in the dorms, late on Thursday nights, we had bull sessions of about 15 students or so, probably about a third of them black in those, in those days. Uh, and they talked about things that had to do with nothing particularly important, their personal lives, their relationship with their parents, their girlfriend back home, money, what their career aspirations were. We had them just talk personally for about six months every Thursday night in these things. Well, that experience improved the, the grade point averages of African American students immediately by a third of a letter grade, increased their graduation rate four years later, and increased their, their their uh, grade point average throughout that period of time. And really inc increased the degree to which their, what they graduated in is what they came in wanting to graduate in. Uh, and why would that be the case? Well, if, if when you normally go to college like that, in that big uh, kind of a university, like the one uh, I'm, a big, I'm a part of at this point, you kind of get in with your own people. And you, when you talk personally, you're talking with, with people you know, who share your background. And if you're talking with people who share your background, uh, you don't really find out what's happening, that, that what's happening to you may be happening to people with a different background. So one of the things they found out in these late night bull sessions is that uh, being black wasn't the only reason that a TA, for example, did not return your email or telephone call or that a professor said something or that you got a lower grade than you expected. But that, that was happening to everybody. That wasn't just happening to you. And so you had a completely different informational basis on which to interpret what's happening to you now. And you realize that the race isn't that big a part of it, and you stop being so vigilant about it. It relaxes that whole part of the brain that's allocated to that vigilance I'm, I'm talking about. You pay, you pay more attention to what, you're, to what you like about college. You, you get better at it. When you get better at it, you feel even freer from this, this kind of pressure. And it starts a positive recursive process that leads to better grades and better, and, and better performance. But I, I tell the story because it's a good example of where the threat is coming from, from the cues in the situation and the kind of things that you have to do to begin to unravel the impact of that, uh, 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 that, that situation. If you want to know how to identify these things, I think there's a trick of mind to doing it. And the trick of mind is this. You can either look at these students uh, as outs from the outside, as observers, as adults, you know, those students need this in order to succeed in life and let's give it to them. Uh, and you go through a whole logic implied by that perception. The trick of mind is to forget that perspective, but to take the perspective of the student, him or herself, to try to put yourself in the shoes of that student. What would it be like walking into that school uh, dealing with that situation uh, uh, as an African-American. What, what, what would it be like? Or as a woman in math, what would that actually be like? And then you begin to identify the circumstances. Because now the perspective is not on the student per se, but on what happens to them. What's happening to them as they, they come in. And you can begin to identify the things that, like Eminem coming out of the bathroom, the things that really would make him more worried about that whole, pro that whole stereotype. So that, that trick of perspective, just taking the actor's perspective, 
person who's acting in the situation gives you some insight into the pressures that, that, that they're probably dealing with down on the ground, and then you can begin to start to remedy those, those, the, those, those pressures that way. Okay. Um, there are other things I want to say on this point. I think that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll save them perhaps for, for questions. The, the, the last thing I want to do is say there are strategies for individuals as, as well. There, there, there are lots of, 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 of important things that, that, that schools can do. Role models are important. Uh, that gives you the existence proof that no matter what the pressures are, some people can have apparently survive at it, and so that gives you a signal that maybe this identity isn't such a big problem. That's one way that that would work. It may be not going to solve everything, but it will uh, help with, with, with some things. Uh, the work of Carol Dweck, I always point out in this situation, is a tremendous uh, advantage, I believe, because inherent in the stereotype is the allegation that you lack an ability, based on your membership in this group, you lack an innate, limiting, fixed ability. You just don't have enough. This whole task, mathematics, the ideology of ability there is that it is a reflection of a fixed capacity. You, got, you, you have to have a bulb with so much, so much wattage in it in order to do well with math. And if you don't have that wattage, you should go somewhere else. That's kind of the American logic. That's not the Asian logic. That's not the Polish logic, the Eastern European logic. That's the American logic. We believe that. If you believe that, then as soon as you get frustrated at math, it's like a signal, well, I just don't belong here. I don't know how upset to be about this, but it's just not my thing. Uh, you know, so you, you withdraw. And then if you're a member of a group whose abilities are negatively stereotyped in that domain, it's just automatic that you leave the domain. But if you think of ability, like probably a good portion of the world does, as something that is expandable, that will yield to the 10,000 hour rule, that if you give deliberate, organized practice to something, you'll get better and better and better and better and better. It helps to start early, really does, but things, ability is expandable. That really is the philosophy, the ideology behind math performance in much of Asia, much of Eastern, Eastern Europe, for example, huge parts of the world that think that way about math, think very differently about it. So then a, neg a negative, you know, the, then being uh, the, the target of a stereotype isn't so stinging and limiting because you have this, this uh, uh, sense that, well, I can, I can get better, I can do better at this thing, that if you have this other understanding of how ability uh, works. Uh, I can I can go on, I, I better come to an end. I'll end with uh, uh, you know, one story of myself, which I, I hope will be uh, uh, helpful, and it goes all, back, all the way back to when I was in graduate school. I do talk about this again in detail in the, in the book, but uh, when I went to graduate school, I was the only African American in the whole social sciences at Ohio State. And uh, there were lots of negative cues like Eminem uh, experience. There were, there were professors down the hall that would use the N-word in those days. Uh, the, everything was about how smart you were. Uh, nobody of my background, other than Kenneth Clark, who I was very remote from at that point, had succeeded in, in this uh, field. So all the heroes, everybody were of some other identity than mine. There was this open discussion in psychology at the time about the, uh, gen the, you know, the racial uh, inferiority of African Americans and intelligence tests. That was an openly discussed thing. There were seminars on campus about this. And here I am in this situation, sort of exhibit A of that group. So uh, it was an intense situation. I think my personality when I was at school was in kind of a lockdown. I, I didn't talk, I didn't participate in seminars. I, I had some sense that if any mistake I would make, I would get seen that way. If you just drifted into dialect for a second, you could be seen in the worst way. And I was invested in this thing. I love psychology. So it was that exact uh, thing. Well, as time went on, my advisor, who was coming up for tenure, and I was his only graduate student, uh, it, it became kind of clear to me that, that this guy was putting his faith in me, that he believed in me. He'd come by my office and he asked me what I thought about the research we were, we were trying to do. And, I, you know, it, it, just, it just became clear to me that in that relationship, I was not being seen stereotypically. In that relationship, I started to feel comfortable and motivated. 
And then we had a little success. And then we published a paper. And oh, man, when we published a paper, you know, I started to feel like, shoo, you know, I, I, can, I can do this, man. Look out. Look, you know, uh, there's, there's room for me here. Now, now, the guy down the hall was still saying the N-word. And, and Arthur Jensen was still on tour talking about the racial inferiority of African Americans and IQ tests and all that stuff. That was still going. To, that still haunts psychology. That whole framework of, of, of thought. Uh, all that was there, but I just didn't feel like it was going to impinge on me in that same way. So I, 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 I want to end on that hopeful note. I think that is an experience that many of us have had in some way or another in our own walks of life, how you identify with a profession. Uh, th this, this has happened to, to many of us. I think that's what we as educators are steering uh, people to do, is to have a narrative about our experience that doesn't enclose us, but that gives us some sense that, yes, this world may not be perfect, but there is a possible way of thriving in it and feeling not under this kind of threat uh, constantly. We have to do our best as educators to reduce those cues, to uh, uh, reduce the degree to which one is too quick to interpret things. We have to do all that. But uh, there, there is a, a, the, the possibility of, of working in that direction and I think giving these students some sense of of belongingness uh, and acceptance in, in this world. And I think we'll see uh, changes in, in performance. Well, at that, I'll stop. Thank you for coming and listening so long. <laughs>